All right, thank you all for coming. Um, just have a quick question. How many people here have ever been to the Temple Mount? All right, so okay, so we got, we got, we got a lot of work to do convincing everybody else. All right, so today I am here to tell you that everything that you have heard about the Temple Mount is wrong. Okay, it sounds like a fun statement, so let's take a look. You may have heard that it is forbidden by Jewish law for Jews to ascend the Temple Mount. You may have heard that Jews cannot pray on the Temple Mount. And you may have heard that there are riots on the Temple Mount specifically because of Jewish visitation and that we are the problem by storming Al-Aqsa Mosque. My name is Rabbi Yehuda Levy, and I'm the co-founder of High on the Har, a 501c3 U.S. nonprofit and Israeli Amuta. And each and every day that the Temple Mount is open, we celebrate the mitzvah of ascension by leading complimentary tours for people of all ages, faiths, and backgrounds. Every day, Jews are allowed to ascend high on the Har in partnership with Yeshivat Har Habayit, host three minyanim, or prayer services, two daily tours, and oversees dozens of peaceful visitors to Judaism's holiest site who tap into the immense inspiration and connection to God at the location he chose for all humankind to serve him. What we don't do and have never done is storm, incite, or even demonstrate there, unlike the Muslims who, at best, treat the site as a park and a playground, playing soccer, flying kites, and having picnics at their supposed third holiest site, or worse, when we are not there, use it as a, demonstrating, a demonstration ground and rallying point to spew anti-Semitic hatred, denying the right of the state of Israel to exist, and calling for the murder of Jews and infidels worldwide. As we sit here today and reflect on Holocaust and Remembrance Day, commemorating six million Jews killed in the name of hate and supremacy, know that last night, a quarter of a million Muslims stood on the Temple Mount and actively waved PLO and Hamas flags and chanted, shouting, Kaiber Kaiber Ya Yahud, a call for Muslims to take up arms and kill the Jew. How can we honestly say, never again, when we allow our enemies to call for our destruction from our holiest of sites? Have we no shame at all? This is why it is crucial that we have a presence on the Temple Mount. This terrible behavior does not happen when Jews are on the Mount. It is only when we are not there that the Muslims treat it as their own a rallying cry and proof that they will one day own all of Israel. For if we are willing to abandon the very heart of our land, the holiest site, the Temple Mount, then clearly our resolve to populate the land isn't as strong as we claim it to be. As the well-known saying goes, he who controls the Temple Mount controls all of Israel. Therefore, our mission at High on the Har is simple. Our focus is threefold to increase ascension to the Temple Mount, to advocate for equal rights and access to the Temple Mount, and to expand awareness of the Temple Mount through meaningful, impactful, and approachable educational content. By reframing the issue of the Temple Mount in the context of human freedoms and rights, and reimagining the Temple Mount movement as a fight for human freedom, my partner, Dr. Melissa Jane Kronfeld, and I, in just one year's time, have become a trusted source for information about the Temple Mount, and as a result, we have fundamentally altered the perception of and prejudice held against the movement for equal rights on the Temple Mount and the need for Israeli sovereignty to be asserted over the Temple Mount. This is the most crucial part of our strategy. The Temple Mount movement has been defined in the media as belonging to the religious fringe, ultra-nationalist, or Zionist zealots. Our movement has been wrongfully portrayed as one of domination and despotism, bent on the disenfranchisement of others, the destruction of Islamic holy sites, and the destabilization of the Middle East. This is a far cry from the truth. The temple has, and always will be, a house of prayer for all nations, as Isaiah proclaimed long ago. The ultimate goal of rebuilding the temple is to connect all of humanity as one in the service of God. By redefining our movement as a human movement, a universal movement, a movement which seeks to secure freedom for all, by establishing a house of God for us all, 
it therefore becomes incumbent upon us all to fight for equal rights on and access to the Temple Mount. And so I would like to present to you a four-part plan of action, a plan which is accessible to all and which hopefully everyone here today will commit to doing their part to participate in. First, before anything else can be achieved, we must secure the rights we have already won. The Israeli government must recognize that the facts on the ground at the Temple Mount have radically changed over the past three years, and therefore the government's policies pertaining to the Temple Mount should reflect this changed reality. For example, when I first personally started to ascend to the Temple Mount, pr prayer was not permitted at all. The Israeli police would escort us, along with Jordanian Waqaf members, who would stand right next to us. And if we even moved our lips, or mumbled something under our breath, or stopped and stood still, we would be immediately removed from the mount and charged with disturbing the peace. Can you imagine that treatment being tolerated against any other religion or race? The word I believe is apartheid. Yet, because of the dedication of the Temple Mount faithful who ascend day in and day out, slowly prayer became normalized. First, we are allowed to mumble and then even given a place to stop for a few minutes. Then slowly but surely audible prayers were tolerated provided that we're very quiet, and so on and so forth. Today, Jewish prayer on the Temple Mount is a regular occurrence. Every day, Jews are permitted to ascend. There, every day that we're permitted to ascend, there are a minimum of three daily prayer services, two in the morning and one in the afternoon, attended by no less than 10 worshipers, and at times as many as 30, 40, or even more. These prayer services occur year-round, regardless of whether it rains or snows or if there's a heat wave. Generally, our, service our services include audible prayers, Torah lessons, and ev every morning the Birkat Kohanim, the priestly blessing, featuring as many as six or more of the Kohanim in our group. Our prayer services proceed uninterrupted by the Israeli police, whom we have built a very close relationship with. Many of them, if not most, have come to the realization that we, the Jewish people are not the problem on the Temple Mount. And some who even empathize with our cause and have admitted to being troubled by the orders that they are given to restrict our prayers or remove us from the Mount from doing so. If we do not begin by securing these rights we have already won, rights we take full advantage of every day, the discrepancy between the policy of the Israeli government to restrict Jewish prayer and empower the police to prevent us from praying, when in reality they no longer enforce this prohibition, ensures that at any time and for any reason what we are doing today on the Temple Mount as it has been for the past few years can be taken from us without a reason or warning as a result of a national election, a shift in political strategy, or simply a change in police command. We have worked too hard and have come too far to allow that to happen. Secondly, we must pursue our goals on a political level. We must continue to support the politicians and parties that are committed to securing equal rights and access to the Temple Mount. We must persuade those politicians who do not yet stand with us that, by doing so, they will be securing and upholding the fundamental freedoms for which the Jewish people has and will always stand for. We must increase pressure on allied governments to support Israel's indigenous rights over the Temple Mount while demanding that they reject the anti-Israel declarations of the United Nations and other international bodies who seek to undermine Jewish rights in the Jewish state by legitimizing the actions of terrorist entities. Third, we must pursue our goals on a personal level. Each and every one of us must undertake the task of being our own light onto the nations by educating others about the Temple Mount by sharing the truth about the atrocities occurring on the Temple Mount, and by pushing back against those who claim that we are the problem, that we have no right to this place, or that ascension is prohibited by Jewish law. Because the fight is not brought to us only by our enemies, but sadly, is also waged by those within our own community. The very many religious Jews who fail to understand the nuance of halacha and deny the fact that his ascension is not only permitted, but essential, which also fulfills five mitzvot, and has been a constant part of Jewish life since Adam offered the first sacrifice to God on the very altar construct constructed under the stone at the peak of Mount Moriah that today lies under the Dome of the Rock. We must, we must push back against the chief rabbin of Israel, who demands that a sign be hung at the entrance of the Temple Mount warning Jews that ascension is prohibited by Torah law, yet fails to cite which law this ruling rests upon, thus providing our enemies with perhaps the greatest weapon they can wield against us. 
We must push back against those Jews who say it is us who are fanning the flames of, and inciting violence by visiting the site of our God's holy house and by praying to him there, because it may upset the delicate sensibilities of some Muslims, many of whom are completely unperturbed by our daily visits and prayers, and showcase through their actions how special this place is to them by dropping garbage and destroying the thousands of artifacts that date back to the First Temple period. But most importantly, we must push back against the Israeli government, our elected officials, who not only trample on our fundamental human rights, but have institutionalized a policy of targeted discrimination based on our Jewish religious beliefs. This is more commonly known as apartheid. This seemingly monumental task of fighting back is easier than you might think. It requires that you do just one thing, and that is to ascend. Ascend to the Temple Mount as often as possible, and bring with you as many people as you can. Because if there is one thing the government cannot ignore, it is the growing number of visitors to the Temple Mount and their increasingly loud complaints about the limited access to the Temple Mount, the lack of equal rights on the Temple Mount, and the arbitrary enforcement of government policy regarding the Temple Mount. If the lines were as long and the demand as great as it is on the holidays, the festivals, Rosh Chodesh, and our national holidays, the government would have no choice but to extend the hours and increase the days which we are permitted to ascend. I don't say this casually. I have been told this directly by those in a position to know, in a position to affect policy, and in a position to enforce any changes made to it. It is critical that we normalize our presence on the Temple Mount, and it is critical that we express how much we care for the Temple Mount, because if we do not take care of our holiest sites, how can we expect our enemies to do so for us? If we do not bear witness to the atrocities occurring on the Temple Mount, the destruction of antiquities, the erasure of Jewish history, and the ongoing acts of violence incited by the Islamic Waqf, the Kingdom of Jordan, and the terrorist elements infiltrating peace-loving Muslims, then we will never know what has been lost, and thus cannot reclaim it in the future. Fourth, and perhaps most importantly, we must pursue our goal of, by wielding the greatest weapon in our arsenal, prayer. Isaiah proclaimed long ago that the very essence of the Temple Mount is to be a house of prayer. That is why prayer, your prayers, are more important than ever. That is why Jewish prayer services occur five days a week facing the entrance of the Temple, the very place where for centuries Jews have prayed to God, and where King Solomon himself, upon consecrating the first Temple, called out to God, not only for the Temple Mount to be the place where prayers of the Jewish people were heard, but where the prayers of all people were heard and most importantly, were answered. But we cannot bring about a house of prayer for all nations if we are not committed to practicing what we preach. All of us here know the power of prayer. We understand that when we call out to God, we are heard, even if we are not always answered in the way that we want to be. Let us all take upon ourselves to pray harder, pray louder, and pray with greater commitment and conviction than ever before. It is time we transform the concept of the Temple Mount from being just part of our ancient past or a promise of a far-off future. We must make the Temple Mount as much a part of our present day, our current reality, as the prayers we pray when praying for it. High on the Heart is actively involved in each of these vital steps, serving on the front lines of perhaps the most important human rights struggle, not only for the Jewish people, but for our entire generation. But we can't do this alone. We need your involvement and help. So, how can you get involved? As we said before, ascend as often as possible. The greatest thing you can do to help us is to come. If we can raise the numbers gradually, if every person who comes brings a friend with them, brings someone else that they know, they talk about it, and when they're sitting here in New York, they're saying, hey, I'm going to Israel in a couple of months. I'm going to the Temple Mount. Really? You're going to the Temple Mount? What's at the Temple Mount? And you talk about it and you explain to them why it's so important. That will help grow the movement. The more Jews that ascend, the more we will win our freedoms there. Tell your friends and family going to Israel to ascend with us as well. If you're not coming yourself, but you hear someone's going, give them a call. Tell them, hey, there's a cool, cool tour on the Temple Mount. I think you should go. It looks really cool. It's quiet. It's peaceful. You'll connect to God on a level you never experienced. Send them to us. We offer free tours. It's not that difficult. As they say, a good Jewish saying, if it's free, take two. Volunteer your time remotely. We're a small organization. It's just a few people, a few volunteers. There's very little overhead because all that what we're doing is just our own personal work. 
anybody who can help us, help push this out, help us grow. It is severely, it is extremely important and appreciated. Join us as a fundraising ambassador, celebrate, celebrating a mitzvah, birthday. You can join our Jerusalem Day campaign, nominate us for grants or awards, make introductions for speaking engagements to your synagogue or local JCC or other grant-making organizations, or donate yourself if you're able to. Stay in touch, sign up, share our content. Everything we produce is on within these main points of our plan to further educate the world about the Temple Mount and why it's so important. So everything we post on social media, share it. It helps us great, reach a greater audience. Learn more. We're always here to help. If anybody has any ideas, we'd love to hear them. We're always looking for ways to push out more content and to get and to get, spread the message far and wide. May we all merit to see the building of the Third Temple and the coming of the Mashiach. But until then, may God continue to bless the Jewish people, the great state of Israel, and may God bless each and every one of you all. Thank you for coming, and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Yep. Yep. So on a, gen on a general day, we have three, the, uh, we, we operate together with Yeshiva Tarabayit, and we have a daily Shacharit Minyan every day at 7 o'clock. And after that, there's a Daf Yom Yishir. And then again, the Kolo, Kolo Drushat Zion, which is the founding, uh, which is the, a part of the Yeshiva Tarabayit, which is also part of Har and the Har facilitates it. Basically, High and the Har serves as a gateway to help people experience the Temple Mount together with the Yeshiva. Because the Yeshiva, seven and a half years ago, was one of the first groups that started the process of normalizing a lot of the prayer. We talked about it, how it started off slowly but surely and get in there. It was mostly due to the daily ascensions of the people who would come up on a regular basis from the Yeshiva. So that was really what facilitated that. And now when High and the Har started, it's more to just p introduce people to that. But once it existed, there really is nothing else like that in the English-speaking space. So it sort of grew into a much larger operation. But yeah, so there's a minyan for Shacharit at 7 o'clock. Again, another one at 9.30. And then in, during the winter, there is a mincha minyan at 12.30. And during the summer at 1.30. Usually during the summer, we'll have two minyanim. One at 1.30 and again one at closer to 2 o'clock. But everything's fluid there. And it really depends on how things roll. I'd actually, if you're okay with it, David, I'd love if you can come up here and share a few words about your experience when you're there and how that felt. Was, that's okay with everybody. Thank you. I'll take more questions afterwards. Okay. Right. Well, everybody, my name is uh, David Franklin. As Rabbi Levy mentioned, I was um, in Israel. I was fortunate enough to be in Israel in January and uh, uh, excuse me, ascend the Temple Mount. I actually. The way it worked out, I booked the tour in the morning, and it was great. And um, he happened to mention during the tour, oh, we can dab in Mincha here also. So I said, oh, great. So I went back home again and was able to dab in Mincha. And I think what I took away from it is as amazing an experience as it was, it really was incredible. It, I, I think it actually affected me even more afterwards when I had a chance to kind of think about where I was and talk about it with other people and just reflect on it myself. It, it's one of those things that really stays with you, and I'll look at the pictures, and I'll say, wow, I was really there, and I'll share it with other people, and, you know, and, and as you said, we do have a lot of work um, educating people. I mean, I, I actually work, full disclosure, I actually work for a Jewish organization, and um, one of the people that I work with when I came back from my trip, um, a girl in her 20s who's Israeli, um, said, you went up to the Temple Mount, you know that's a provocation, right? So, you know, we've, we've got... Uh, We've got some work to do, but um, it's an incredible experience. Just you know, Rabbi Levy's knowledge of the of the Temple Mount inside and out. Just you're not just walking around; you're getting a real full picture of the history and and every, literally every step that you take, he's pointing things out and stuff that things that you would never never under, never know. Like if you went up there on your own, you wouldn't have a clue probably of, of most of the stuff that he's able to point out. So. If you haven't gone yet, go and um, spread the word, as he said. So if anybody has any que uh, questions for me, happy to try and take them. You mentioned that um, you will take pictures of the Mount. Are they okay with you? Yeah, I mean, I took plenty of pictures. I didn't have a problem. 
no problem is. The official policy is to not, is to not have a problem with taking pictures. And in general, the, the rules that the Israeli police will, will introduce, that's okay, I'll stand next sure, to you. Sure. Oh, this is a great privilege. Yeah. Um, My privilege. So <laughs> the, uh, the, the official rules is that when you, would, when you will come to the Temple Mount at the beginning, uh, there will, you'll be met by a police officer. Um, Moataz Tapash and uh, Erez Cohen, the two that are currently there, and uh, very very nice individuals, and they'll give you the official rules. They'll say you, you cannot, you're not allowed to pray, you're not allowed to do show any religious affiliation, you're not allowed to bring up any flags or touch any stones or move things around or do anything that's a provoca provocation. If you have any questions, ask one of the police officers who are guiding you on the Temple Mount, and they'll tell you if it's allowed or not. You know, yada yada, stuff like that. In practice, you see that the reality has been different, that even though there's the official policy that this is what needs to be said, and they actually do check the, uh, the higher ups in the Israeli police will make sure if they, if they catch the police officer not giving that talk at the beginning when you come up there, they get into a lot of trouble, which is why they always turn their body cams on when they do the <laughs> class, because it's actually just to prove that they, hey, we did it. Um, uh, in, in practice, once we're up on the mount, it, 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 for the vast majority of days that we're there on a daily basis, it's really quiet there. Sometimes we'll have, uh, even when we bring a large group, I've brought groups of up to 50 people, which is stretching the limits of what the police will allow. And obviously in coordination with them, we work very, very closely with the Israeli police. We, uh, we try very much to make all of our efforts in conjunction with them and not opposed to them. And there are organizations who try to undermine the authority of the police and we do not stand with that at all. It is our firm belief that we as Jews and as part of, as Israeli citizens, it's our job to work within the system and not to work against the system. Um, but we'll always, so we'll always coordinate with the police. But once you're up on there and even for the large group, there's almost, there's never any riots or anything, uh, any problems from the Muslims there. They're doing their thing, we're doing our thing. We can respect one another. Uh, there are a lot of walk of guard, uh, guards there who I know personally, who I'll talk to, and I'll have a nice, we'll have a nice conversation. Usually they prefer not to speak Hebrew, <laughs> but we'll do it in English or Arabic. But uh, my Arabic isn't terrible, but not, don't test me on it. Um, but for the most part, they're, they're, we, can, we can respect one another. And that's exactly the point that we're trying to say is that the more we're there, the more we turn the Temple Mount into a place of connection to God, it is that inherent human right that we all have to communicate with God because God created each and every one of us in His image. It doesn't matter what religion you are or what denomination or race or gender you are, you were created in the image of God. And if you were created with the image of God, then you have that inherent human right to communicate to God. And the place where God has chosen for all, from all places in this universe as the, primary, the premier place of connection and prayer and supplication since the dawn of time, according to the biblical narrative, is on Mount Moriah, Har HaMoriah, the Temple Mount, which is today the peak of it, known in Jewish, in, by, in Jewish literature as the Evan Hashtiyah, or the Rock of Conception, the first thing that was created, and known to the Muslims as the Sakhar Stone. That place is inside the Dome of the Rock today. So you can get as close as possible to that and to use that power, that immense spiritual power, to connect, that's something really, really unique. But getting back to your question about pictures being allowed, the police allow full pictures to be there, to be taken there, and it's actually, uh, uh, people take advantage of that. The one word of caution that we have in our, in our Ascension guy, uh, group, uh, in our guide that we send out, is that don't lose the moment. You're here on the Temple Mount. You have that power to connect to. You're so busy on your phone. Yeah. That might be uh, something else. Anything else you want to add? Uh, no, I think that's... Uh... All right. Anybody else have more questions for David? I do. All right. So, and then I have questions for you after. I'm not going to. <clears throat> so you said you had this certain feeling when you got up there. I was curious what it was. I've been up there once, maybe twice, I'll remember. First time I may have been, I was in Solomon's stables underneath before it was ruined. Um, and then I went with Mayor Dinkins, and we went up on the mountain, we went into the mosque. So that was a different experience entirely. I'm sure. But for you, what, because we know the experience of the Western Wall, and that's been built up as the peak experience. It hasn't been that, you know, that's great, but you should only know. 
And so there's a narrative you're bringing into this that I don't think has been brought into it, even the Mount Moriah side of it. You know, the, the sense that, what was your feeling when you got up there? That, that if we express it more to people, in, this, in a sense, the real target has been the Jews not being allowed. I mean, a lot of it also, I'll get a little personal here for a moment, is my background. I mean, I'm about Shuva, this is my wife, and grew up not very religious, became religious in my 30s. Um, so just saying, wow, I, like, you know, think, being up there and thinking about where, where I've been in my life and where, and to be on a place like this, it was, it was very intense, you know, just to have that, uh, have that feeling on a, on a personal level. Um, and just, you know, Knowing or having the history explained to me as as we're going to make it's like you think you know, but when you have somebody who really knows explain it to you, it's it's a different level, and that just kind of really that just took it up took took it up a bit more for me, and just you know knowing how important it is to be there for Jews to be there, and unfortunately too many of us aren't you know, haven't gone there, and there is power in numbers, and if more of us go there. That yeah, definitely will make a difference, but I, I think I, I hope I've answered your question. I mean, I, I feel like it was just, you know, just reflecting. It was more a thing for me of, of reflecting where I've come from in my life, and um, just the fact that I was there to me, uh, thinking about like this is something that years ago would not have crossed my mind in any way, shape, or form. Um, you know, and then to now actually get there, it was, it was really, uh, it was, it was intense. Yeah, it really intense. leads into it because ultimately. It's as we've never been really satisfied with anything. That's the ultimate, and and we haven't really looked at it. Most people haven't looked at it or thought of it quite that way, you know, because it's been off, off limits. The dream of you know rebuilding the the, the temple, but in the meantime, we got the war. Yeah. So yeah. so it's great what you do. Thank you. If I, if I may add just uh, a little bit to what uh, David was saying to answer your question, it's a terrific question. And it really boils down to everything that we're talking about here in, this, in today's presentation, which was, yes, the reason why the Western Wall is viewed as that intense experience, and I personally experienced it too. I grew up in Lakewood, New Jersey, very religious, never even heard the concept of going up to the Temple Mount. That was so, it was so foreign to me. Right? And all I knew is that my father told me, he's like, hey, you're, gonna, you're going to Israel to study. Make sure it's the first thing you do is go to the Western Wall. God's waiting for you at his house. Right? And I got off the plane. It was about 6 o'clock in the afternoon. Until I got to Jerusalem, put my bags down in, my, in a friend's uh, you know, apartment. I didn't even have a place to stay at. It was all, everything was flying. But I knew I couldn't go to sleep before until I went to the Western Wall. And I somehow managed to find my way through the alleyways to the old city. I get there and I, and I get a look up the wall. And I'm like, wow. Like, that, that feeling that we all, yeah. I've groom, I was groomed my whole life to, groom is a bad word, but you know what I mean. It's that I, was, yeah. I was conditioned my whole life to get up to that, to that intense feeling. But when you really, really study it from a rabbinic level, and, I, and it's not, you don't have to be a rabbi to do this, but anybody goes through the sources, and you understand why is there such a special connection to, to the Western Wall, is it, it's because it's part of the temple complex. So what makes the temple special? Well, if we're going to talk about why the Western Wall is special, we have to know why the temple is special. And you start going through the sources of how, as it says in Masechet Smachot, that this is the place that God first created the world from. He created the Evan Hashdiyah. From there the world sprang forth. And as Maimonides writes in the Laws of the Chosen Temple, chapter 2, um, Halacha 2, he writes as follows. It is a tradition in the hands of all that the place where David and Solomon built the temple was the same place that the Akedah, the binding of Isaac, took place. We know that, that, that uh, Abraham took Isaac to the mountain in Mount Moriah and he bound him and he was about to sacrifice him. A seminal moment in Judaism. One of the main things that when, when do we invoke that, that day? On the holiest day of the year, on Yom Kippur. We remind God of this thing. Um, and on, on Rosh Hashanah, when we talk about that, at the beginning of the year, we talk about that, that commitment that our forefather was willing to sacrifice his son. That's how intense we are within our connection with God. 
That very spot was there. And not only was that that spot, but it was also the spot where Noah, after coming out of the flood, Noah came out of the, out of the ark. He came out from, from Mount Ararat, which was located in northern Turkey, and traveled specifically to this spot on Mount Moriah to, build, to bring an offering, to, thank, to say thanks to God for being safe from the flood. He couldn't do it in, in Turkey. You would think, if you were looking at it from a rational level, if we, God's everywhere. He's omnipotent. So why can't we communicate with him from anywhere? But yet he chose the place, a specific place, to be at Mount Moriah. And therefore, Noah traveled from Turkey to Mount Moriah to bring an offering there. But it's not all, it says, continues Maimonides. That place was also the place where the first carbon battle, the first offering battle took place between Cain and Abel, Cain and Hevel. And each one had their theory about what's the better way to serve God. Do you do it through animals or through vegetation? And they had that fight there. And they both brought their offerings on that very altar on top of Mount Moriah. But even more so, the first offering that was ever brought in this world by the first man, Adam, took place at this very mountain. And not only that, says Maimonides, but this was the place where Adam himself was created. So we're seeing a theme here. That of all the places in the world, this place has a spe special place to it. And, the, and our rabbis teach us that mankind was created from the place of their entonement. So that spot at the top of the mountain, at Mount Moriah, that Evan Hashdiya, that rock of conception, has some sort of spiritual power. You might call it, you would, you might call it like the meeting place between the physical world and the spiritual heavens. We can go up today in satellites. We can go up in, with, with rocket ships. We're going to look all, uh, for these heavens. We're not going to find them because they're not a physical concept. There's some sort of spiritual concept that we can't understand because we're physical beings. But we can understand that there's that power. And when Jacob had his dream at that spot and he saw the ladder going up and he awoke and he proclaimed, it's impossible that God's at this place. And I didn't realize with great awesomeness and fear, he proclaimed, how awesome is this place? This is the house of God and the gateway to heaven. The rabbis learned from there that anybody who prays at that very spot in Jerusalem is as if they're praying in front of the heavenly throne because the gateway to heaven is there. That means that portal is there and we have that opportunity to tap into that. And when you're standing at the Western Wall, you can sense it because you're so close. But I guarantee you, when you're standing on the Eastern side of the, of the Temple Mount and you're looking up to the staircase where you know that you just were, where we can see that that is where the gates of Nicanor once stood, the entrance to the temple. And you're looking up at the Dome of the Rock and you can envision in your mind the temple standing a third higher than the sphere of the Dome of the Rock. And you're looking into that power and you're like, I'm standing right there. I'm as close as I can get towards that, towards channeling my prayer straight up through that portal. It's a different experience. Just last piece of this. As what you were saying, is it possible to do Temple Mount hyphen Mount Moriah? Because most people don't connect Mount Moriah at all <laughs> with that site. You, could, you connect the temple, but you're bringing the sacred site itself. That's a good like idea. They, you, just like with West Bank, I was very Judea Samaria. Yeah. You know, so the idea of bringing the biblical connected with, I don't know where the Temple Mount came from, but it's not exactly the same as saying Mount Moriah. I hear that. That's a fair point. Thank you. All right. Anybody else have questions for David? <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for, for, for that. I really appreciate it. And I'm happy to take any other questions as well. All right. I think um, the gentleman so, behind. From a purely practical standpoint, mm -hmm. how is it that you're working with the police and yet effectively violating the, the law of their presence? Like, how does that even do? That seems like an oxymoron. <laughs> and then, if you do have a police officer that, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. decides to fuck, particularly you're saying bring your friend, let's say. <laughs> and if you do have a police officer that, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. decides to follow the letter of the law that day, right. you, have, you go and I assume that you're on this. Like, is there something I'm missing here? from a purely pragmatic standpoint? That's a terrific question. It's a real terrific question. And the answer is, Israel is not the United States. <laughs> but I think if you get into a, deeper, into a deeper rule, there are officially rules, 
call it the status quo, if you will, call it how it is or whatever the, the reason why the rules are the way they are. But if you really look at the actual law book of the state of Israel, you will see that there's a law that states that there is freedom of religion guaranteed for every single person in the state of Israel. There cannot be a law that will demand that a person lose their religious freedom. So how do we jive that law with what's going on in the Temple Mount? The Supreme Court of Israel put in an exception to that rule that enables the Israeli police to determine whether or not there are things that would cause uh, national security. And if they feel that, th that it is, they have a right to limit people. So let's say, for example, um, the law is that everybody, there's freedom of religion. So if a Muslim would want to go pray at Al-Aqsa Mosque during a high intention part, by law, the Israeli government cannot stop a person from doing so. Yet, practically, because of their security situations, they can make assessments to determine that certain, a certain age group, and remember, there's, they're allowed to profile over there, so it's a little different than, than laws that are here in the United States, but they can determine that a certain age group, let's say young men from the age of 20 to the age of 45, are more likely to create problems over there, and therefore they will bar those people. Now it seems like they're breaking the law, right? The Israeli, government, the, the Israeli law says there's no freedom of religion, but the police have that power. So the police have decided that Jewish prayer on the Temple Mount, for whatever reason, is a provocation. Now is it? Practically we see for the last three years that we've been praying nonstop, and the Arabs know that we've been praying, and they witness it. And yet, it's not, when, they're, when they're choosing to make their, their stand against, against Jewish visitation, what do they show? They just show people walking, and they say, Israeli, you know, Israeli radical settlers storming Al-Aqsa. It's never about us praying. They're standing right next to us. They can see, they take pictures and videos of us all the time. That doesn't seem to bother them. In fact, I would say, knowing how religious they are, they appreciate the fact that we're coming to pray because it shows them that what we're trying to do is again tap into that immense spiritual power there. It's those that are coming to be provocative in their eyes of, of taking back what they perceive as theirs that they, I can see, I can understand why they would have an issue with. So to answer your question, the Israeli police, the same way they could decide to uphold their, their um, arbitrary ruling that today prayer is going to cause a problem, can also decide not to uphold it. And really the arbitrary power is in their hands. I wouldn't say that it's the foot soldiers, it's the, small, it's the, the, the lower level, lower ranking police officers, um, but in a way they're the ones who have to decide whether to report an infraction to the higher ups. So our, our work is really tied to all ends. We're tied to being, uh, you know, befriending the lower, lower people, the lower ranking officers who are very special. And their, their job is in, in, in ways the harder one because they're sitting there as the stones are being thrown at them and as the, the insults are being hurled at them and they're standing strong and, and doing their job. And for that, we are eternally grateful. They, they, they do something that I am not blessed to do. But at the same time, you know, if, if they get an order from the higher ups that it can't be done, they also have to stick to it. And that's why, it, it, that's why there's an inconsistency there on the Temple Mount. There are times that, for example, we'll go for months at a time with doing the same prayer service in a regular way without any issue. And then without warning, the next day we'll show up and all of a sudden, no, it can't be done. It has to be done in a little different way. And we're like, what happened? What changed? Until we go up the chain of command to find out what police officer got which ruling or which comment made by which government minister to be able to figure it all out. It's, it's difficult. That's one of the things I called for is that this, this, the, the Israeli government should, re, should honor the changes that have been made. And it's on us, the constituents, both the pro-Israel community, both here in Israel and here in the United States, to push the, the community to say, hey, the reality has changed. We've seen over the last three years prayer being normalized on the Temple Mount, and it hasn't called, caused World War III. It hasn't caused um, the problems. In fact, the very opposite, the Abraham Accords took place at the very time that prayer was normalized on the Temple Mount. So let's write this into law. There should be no reason that the police are deciding on a, based on a whim to limit that prayer. I hope that answers your question. It does. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else have any questions? You mentioned earlier about one of the key arguments about the Temple Mount is that there's a verse or a law that prohibits it. But 
seems like the way it's been promoted that seems to be not the case. Where is this uh, vision coming from? That's a terrific question. And actually, just last night I gave a well, it was supposed to be a half hour lecture, but really was an hour and a half lecture on this very topic, going through in great detail all through the uh, discussion, the, the, how, how we can trace it. I'm going to try to summarize it very, very briefly. I quoted to this uh, fine gentleman here um, from Maimonides' words about how our tradition places that area from the beginning of the creation through the temple of being, being built. And then there is a clear Misora tradition from the destruction of the second temple till today, with, and leaving a very clear paper trail, delineating exactly where the temple, the, the Holy of Holies, once stood on the Temple Mount. Now, people say, well, if you go to the Temple Mount, you might walk in the area of what is known as Machaneshchina, or the, divine, the camp of the divine presence. That, according to Torah law, and we all agree to this, is strictly prohibited for someone who is a Tamimet or someone who is the, uh, the category of being impure by coming in contact with a dead body. It's very difficult, the laws, we're not going to get too technical, but we have to safely assume that every one of us is that status. Why? We're all born in hospitals, right? And there are, there, that would basically put us into that category. And therefore, if anybody's ever been at a funeral or has ever been in a, you know, in a, in the same building as the dead body, that would also render them to this, be this, this form of impurity. And the only way to get rid of it is to be sprayed by the ashes of the red heifer, which I don't know if you've checked, but I don't think we have access to. And even though Machona Megdash, the Temple Institute, is working, is working very hard on <laughs> getting access to that, currently they're not there yet. So, if one would enter into that area, there would be liable to a very severe punishment in Judaism known as the Karet penalty. And that is a, a, a very big thing. I'm sorry? Is that above the stairs? We'll, we'll get into exactly where it is, but great question. So the reason why people say don't go to the religious Jews will say don't go to the Temple Mount is because we can't, they're, they're assuming that all of the Temple Mount is, this, is this, uh, this area, which would preclude us from ever entering into it. And then that would mean that we're stuck by the Western Wall or any of the other walls, for that matter. They're all the same wall. Right, the south wall, the east wall. In fact, it's a remind me how we ended up start, how we ever got to praying at the western wall is, is a cool story by itself. Okay, so when the Jews traveled in the desert, as they were traveling from the land of Egypt to the land of Israel, they camped in in a certain format. There was imagine a square. I'll use my computer for uh, for a thing. There's a square. Okay, imagine this is a square in that direction. The outer part of the square was where the tribes all lived. Inside was where the Levites, the Levim, would live. And inside was the tabernacle, right on the ample logo, because we all know what ample is. <laughs> all right? So, right? So we have the, this would be the tabernacle. Now, the Torah tells us that the outer part of the square where all the tribes lived was known as the camp of the Israelites. The inner part where the Levites lived was the camp of the Levites. And the tabernacle was the camp of the Divine Presence. So, following the rule of where a Tamei Met is not allowed into, would only be in the tabernacle. But a Tamei Met would be allowed in the, inner, uh, the, the middle camp of the Levites and in the outer camp of the Israelites. The Talmud tells us that just as there were camps in the desert, there were also camps in Jerusalem. And it tells us those boundaries. The city of Jerusalem is considered the camp of the Israelites. The Temple Mount, meaning all of the Temple Mount, up to the entrance of the actual Temple building, was the camp of the Levites. And from the doorway of the building of the Temple itself, meaning from the gates of Nicanor, to the back of the Holy of Holies, that would be the area of the camp of the Divine Presence. So if we were to be able to place the Temple building on today's Temple Mount, we would know, based on the measurements laid out in the Mishnah, which is very, very clear, it delineates exactly that it was the length of, it was uh, the width of 135 cubits by 322 cubits. If we can find the starting place to place that on the Temple Mount, we would be able to very easily understand which is the forbidden area which we are now allowed to go into, and by extension, where we are allowed to go to. Okay, so 
as I mentioned before, the longest standing, one of the longest standing traditions in Jewish history is that the location of the, of the Holy of Holies, the back part of the temple, I actually believe I brought my map with me, so it'll be easier to visualize this. I hope everybody can see. Okay? Here we have a map of the Temple Mount. Okay? Here's the Kotel, the western wall. You're probably used, used to looking at it from this angle. Okay? And here is the building of the Dome of the Rock. Now, when you see on this part over here, this area here is the Holy of Holies, and our tradition places this Holy of Holies as the center, which is currently located into the Dome of the Rock, source after source after source from the destruction of the Temple in the year 70 CE till today, without missing any major time block, places it there. As a result, using the measurements laid out in the Mishnah, we can know exactly where the forbidden area is, which means that in practical terms, the only forbidden area for one to enter onto the Temple Mount today is 13% of the entire Temple Mount. The rest of the Temple Mount, this area here, right, this area here is the status of Machan Levia, and in order for one to be a, a permitted to go into that area, according to Jewish law, they would have to first immerse in a kosher mikvah. So therefore, if you ever sign up for a tour on high in the har, you will get an ascension guide which will explain exactly how to do all of that. It's a very, a very simple process. And therefore, if it, you would do that, you'd be able to go onto the Temple Mount without any issue. But the, the miscommunication comes from, or this idea that it was is forbidden by Jewish law, and the fact that the chief rabbinate doubles down on the rulings given in 1967, because one of the great rabbis who signed that ruling wrote in another book explaining his reasoning. He wrote, Elu Nasim. How many people here speak Hebrew? Not enough? Okay, so we'll, 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 uh, we'll do it in English. Those who enter are not consulting wisdom and are not doing something smart. They are entering into the Miskad Omer, meaning the Mosque of Omer, which is a, a, a common term throughout history referring to the Dome of the Rock. They are entering into the Miskad Omer, which is 100% the place of the Holy of Holies. What are they thinking when they're entering into the Holy of Holies? Meaning, from Rabbi Yosef's words, he's agreeing to the very tradition that the Dome of the Rock is in fact the location of the Holy of Holies, and therefore he knows exactly where it's forbidden to enter, and yet people are still entering into those areas. So what did he do? He said, don't go onto the Temple Mount. But practically today, if you were to join with us, if you go up to the entrance of the Temple Mount as part of a group with High and the Har, or Yeshivat Harabite, or any of the other organizations that are going there, you will be going with a, uh, with a guided group with the Israeli police, which has three main functions. Number one, to keep us safe, and for that we're eternally grateful. Number two, to prevent us from going into the forbidden areas, and therefore you will follow a very unique route that is set up by the rabbis, which avoids the elevated platform. Now the only place where correct penalty is possible is on this elevated platform. So, if you come up as a tourist and you just avoid the temple, the, that area on the top, you're totally, in, you're totally in the clear. But if you come up with us, you'll go through this, this path that we go over here, and over here is where we pray. We mentioned the prayer. It takes place at the east, right on this little path here, looking into the entrance of the, of the, of the, the Beit HaMikdash, the temple. And if we, over here is where we do our daily learning, our daily Torah, Torah, Torah study. And then we continue out and around. That's reason number two. Reason number three that the Israeli police are there to protect us is to prevent us from doing provocations, right? And we've discussed that at length. So, to answer your question, hopefully I didn't get too technical and I hope everybody followed, the only area that is forbidden to enter onto with a karet penalty is this area here, practically because there's no markers to know. So if you were to visit the Temple Mount without going with a guide, just avoid the elevated platform which the Dome of the Rock sits on. And you'll see the only way to get onto there is to go up steps or a ramp. So it's pretty easy to avoid that area. Practically though, if you're going to come to the Temple Mount, come with us. We give a great tour, as David, a uh, shameless plug for, him, for, our, for our tour services. But that, that would uh, hopefully explain exactly where the fear came from and why it's not something to be concerned of today. Thank you. Anybody else? You got a question? Amazing. Yeah. I'll ask one more, which is bring it up to, I guess going back to the original name, bring it up to Aaron. Mm -hmm. So when David and Solomon were looking where to build the temple, 
there obviously was a thinking pattern in terms of Mount Moriah and, yep. and, and going there. Mm -hmm. So there's a story with that which a lot of us have no clue. Now, the second part is the Knesset. Okay. So you talk about passing law and so forth. How, how possible is that or not? So you're talking about both ends. One was finding the sacred site and two is saying this is our sacred site and they've actually harmed our faces. Okay, so terrific question, uh, as, as you've shown to constantly ask great ones. Um, I'm going to try to break it down because there's a lot of different information about, about the two parts. So I'm going to leave the second question for this, on the side for now and try to answer the first one. When David and Solomon chose to build this spot, the, the, the Sukkim, the, the verses in, in, um, in Samuel and also in Kings, delineate exactly how that process went down. But we can, we can trace a very long process, even though the Jews were in, enslaved in, in Egypt for 200 years, that this was a place that they knew about. Right, we mentioned Adam, Cain and Abel. We mentioned Abraham, uh, Noah, Abraham. And then Isaac, the, the Medrash tells us that Isaac and Rebekah, when they didn't have children for many years, they came to Mount Moriah. They prayed there, and they were immediately answered with their twins. We saw Jacob and uh, we, uh, Jacob, when he was running away from Esau, he went to pray at Mount Moriah, and he saw the dream with the angels going up. And then we sort of see, see a break, right? The, the, the rest of the tribes, they go down to Egypt, they get enslaved there, and then they come back after 40 years of the, in, the, in the desert. And where do they set up the, the tabernacle? Is it in Jerusalem? No. First it's in Nob and Givon and Shiloh and, and, in, and a bunch of other places. What's going on with that? It wasn't, cho it wasn't set up originally in Jerusalem because that was the place where it was uh, destined to be un until, all the, until all the political natures and, and spaces were, were put together. It, the, God did not want that to be the spot of his, of his temple. It was only once everything was solidified in probably, arguably, the, the most the powerful time that the Jewish people ever worked together under the rule of David and Solomon. That's when that table, temple was, was built. And if you look through the, the story there, David takes over the throne from King Saul. He actually was the son-in-law of Saul. And he has his kingdom. He's the kingdom of, of Judah. And he is based in Hebron, in Hebron. And then he goes and conquers a small area of land that had not yet been conquered, called Jerusalem. The, the verses in, in Samuel 2 describe a great length how he went and did and do that. He sent his general in to go through one of the tunnel tours, uh, the tunnels over there, the water tunnels, and somehow managed to open up the gates. If you're ever in the city of David, I highly recommend going to their tours there. They have great videos and explanations of, that, of the history there of how he broke in by the Siloach uh, pool. And David wants to immediately build the temple at the top of Mount Moriah, which is the city of David, is on the, the southern slope of Mount Moriah. But God tells him no. He said, because you have waged many wars, your hands are filled with blood, and I need someone who is a peaceful king to build that temple. But how did David know that that was the spot? So it says that David made a mistake, and he counted the Jewish nation in an improper way, and that set off a plague. And David saw a vision of the angel of God at the top of Mount Moriah in what was a threshing floor by Arnon the Jebusite at the top of the mountain. The angel was standing there with his sword outstretched over the city of Jerusalem. And that's when David realized that this is that spot. Even he, he knew that this was the spot, but he didn't really fully appreciate its significance until he saw that. He went up to the, te the top of the, of, the, of the mountain, and he's the king. He could have just said, hey, move out of here. I'm taking the spot. But no, he chose to buy the property, an unusual move for a monarch. He bought the property from Arnon the Jebusite, and he offered an offering at that spot. And at that point, the plague stopped. And that's how he knew that that was the, the spot that was going to build up. But as Maimonides writes, it wasn't just there. There was a tradition from old that that was the same spot. If you look throughout the Torah, you'll notice that Jerusalem is never mentioned. 
until the, 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 until it was the, the city was built up by David and Solomon, you won't find the word Jerusalem. Yet you'll find the interesting word Hamakom, or Bamakom, the place. Because technically, the place could be anywhere in the, city, in the area of Israel. It was only once Solomon laid that roots down in that, in that temple, and he prayed to God and said, this should be the place of a place of prayer. When he set up the temple, its whole essence was to be a place of prayer, of connection to God. And God says to him, I have accepted your prayer, and I have chosen to put my name on this house for all time. My eyes and my heart shall never leave this place. And from that point forward, the rabbis teach us that there is no longer the ability for that place to move, with one exception. When Elijah was on Mount, Mount, Mount Har Carmel, and he was having that demonstration between him and the, the, the prophets of the, the god Baal. And they were trying to prove who's the real god. And Elijah told the, the, the prophets of the Baal, go ahead, see if you can call down fire from, from God. And they tried all morning. They weren't, able, weren't successful. And the, and the verses tell us that at the time of the offering, of the afternoon offering, Elijah took his turn and he prayed to God and he said, please let just this once move the Hamakom, that place, to Mount Carmel. And God accepted it just for that one time. Fire came down and burnt his offering, proving that God was a true God. So it says in the book of Kings. But we see that Hamakom, God really is omnipotent. He could choose to make his place anywhere, but he had chosen that spot at Mount Moriah as to be the place where it, meet, where it meets and is set up for all time. As the verse says, my, item, my eyes and my heart will be there for all time, even when it's destroyed. So when we go today to that spot, we're still tapping in, as Maimonides says, why is the place still holy? Because what makes it holy? It's the Shechina, the divine presence that lives there. And the Shechina never dissipates. It's always there. So we can tap into that. So that explains a little bit about the background, about why that spot was there and how they knew it and why it's still relevant today. Now, on the political aspect of it, in terms of the politicians who can affect change, well, Israel is a democracy. And we're here in Fuel for Truth. We get to tap into the pro-Israel Israel talk, and I'm glad to participate. Israel is a democracy. Democracies are, by their very nature, the will of the people. If the people demand something, you better believe the politicians will fall in line because they want to stay in power, and the only people giving them the power are the people. So imagine if everybody wanted a, a law on the books that marijuana would be allowed in Israel. You can bet your bottom dollar that that law would be passed. But if nobody wanted it, the law would be passed that it would be not allowed. Similar here, right? It works the same way, although Israel's not, I mean, America is not technically a democracy. It's more a republic, so it works with different, different ways to get laws on the books. But Israel is a true democracy. So at that point, if, every, if the majority, as I always say, 80% of the people want there to be sacrifices on a temple on the Temple Mount, there'll be sacrifices on the Temple on the Temple Mount. But right now, we're a tiny minority. The vast majority of people have no care for it, or at worst, think it's forbidden to even approach it. We, meaning, everybody knows on an intellectual level, yet this is our holiest site. But people are afraid to approach it, and actions speak louder than words. So until we're willing to take the action to really set it down and to go there. And that's why I said the most important thing you could do is to ascend. Because the more you ascend, the more you send the message to the politicians, to the government, that this is, in fact, our holiest site. And as, as we treat it more and more like our holy site, the government will reflect their reality. The government spends millions of shkalim every single year to make the Kotel Plaza a beautiful place, a place that everybody's comfortable going to. So there's nothing really stopping them from sending that same amount of money on the Temple Mount. So they're not just going to throw their money away if we're not saying, hey, we want this. And I think uh, something even worse, if you, if you look, the Israeli government just tweeted out um, a picture of a quarter of a million Muslims on the Temple Mount. And you can see it's packed. And then another picture of 100,000 Christians at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, packed. And it wrote, Israel is committed to religious freedom for all. Right? Now, where's the picture of, of Birkat Kohanim at, at the Kotel, right? But even more so, 
And this same government just literally kicked off all Jews from going to the Temple Mount now. The last 10 days of Ramadan, you guys are not allowed. And yet, they have the gall to, to post that. But the funniest thing is, is that 90, I would, I would venture to say, not 90%, but a very vast majority of people aren't perturbed by that. They don't even see the craziness of such a tweet. And that itself is the biggest problem. We have to try to change that perception. And the only way we could do that is we're not, we don't, we're, I'm not a big media machine. I don't, I don't control TV. I, don't, I know I'm a Jew. I'm supposed to, but sadly, I didn't get those genes. So, therefore, we start one person at a time. And if every person here accepts upon themselves to be an ambassador for this, I don't mean that you should walk into Thanksgiving and start preaching about the Temple Mount, but you have it in your own way where you can, where you can say, hey, I'm here going to Israel. This is cool that you should check out the Temple Mount. Consider that as a place to visit. It's your God-given right, your human right to communicate with Him. And it doesn't matter how religious you are, you're not religious at all, you want to, talk, you want to call it meditation, or you want to call it whatever you like to call it. But come. This is the key to it all, because this is the heart as we mentioned, my eyes and my heart will be there for all days. This is the heart of the Jewish land. And if we really want the Jewish land and we want to keep it as a place with, that has tolerance for religious freedoms for all and wants it to be a place where everybody has access to and freedom for all and human rights, sadly we've seen what happens when other governments take over places, how much those freedom rights suffer. If we want to keep it that way, then it's on upon us to stand up for it. All right, anybody else have questions? Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate your time. It's not easy to get out. I know the Yankee game is today. I don't know the Yankees or the Mets or someone's playing, but you chose your time to come here, so I appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all at the Temple Mount. If you can all do us a favor, um, you can go on to our website, highonthehire.com, and as soon as you go on there, you'll see like a pop-up. You can put in your email address and your, and your name. You can add yourself to our mailing list. You'll see our follow us on social media. It'll be a lot to us because, again, the more we can push out the content, the more you see it and you like it and you spread it, the more it can help us. Thank you for coming. Have yourselves all a great night. And may, just as we spent the time today talking about the Temple Mount and its state of destruction, may we all see the building of the Beit HaMikdash, the Temple, with the coming of the Mashiach. Amen. Speedily in our days.